Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the beaches were copper, the pince-nez was golden, and the blaze was silver, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about the difference between Holmes's pipes? Or how often he smokes cigars versus cigarettes? Or what Egyptian cigarettes are like? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 251, Butterflies. Hello and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at some of the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, I am so glad we've taken you out of mothballs today. I am too. I hate the smell of camphor, but now I can get my tweeds out and dine. <laughs> Well, feast away, my friend. We'll be getting into this subject in just a moment. Uh, first, a little bit of homework or uh, housekeeping. The show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash trifles251. That's all lowercase. That'll take you to sherlockholmespodcast.com where we will have any associated links or other things that you might want to check out. You can even listen to the show directly from the site there. And please make sure you're getting updates from us, whether it's through your podcatcher or through email. You can sign up right there on the website. We want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of Trifles when it's released every Wednesday. Well, it is that time of the month in Season 5 uh, where we look at exotic animals. Uh, I think we were here last month talking about, oh gosh, was it blind beetles? Yes, I believe so. My goodness. Uh, and, and poor Ringo and, and Paul and John. I mean, they certainly didn't need to be. Uh, blinded. No, not those kinds of beetles. It was the insectivore uh, kind of beetles. Um, and now we are latching on to the other half of that, butterflies. The inspiration of this episode, the last two episodes in the Exotic Animals series, comes from a series done by uh, Donald Gerard Jewell. Don Jewell was a Sherlockian. He was actually the father-in-law of John Lellenberg. Um, he wrote a series of monographs called the Sherlock Holmes Natural History Series. And this is volume four, I believe, in uh, the series, uh, Butterflies and Blind Beetles. So, uh, there are scant few episodes, or, or uh, I should say stories, where uh, butterflies or uh, their related cousins, moths, are uh, mentioned. So, I think we'll have... Uh, it, it'll just be brief uh, in terms of our canonical connection there, but it gives us an opportunity to talk more about the insect order and about some of the points that Don Jewell pointed out in his monograph. Yeah. So, where would you like to begin? Well, we could begin at a very high level. You know, butterflies, it's an amazing subject. It was enormously popular in Victoria and England. Butterflies is a motif in fashion and ornaments and things like that. And if you look back at the history, the legends and things, you know, you find some very weird things. In Ireland, butterflies were thought to be either the souls of dead grandfathers or the souls of the newly dead waiting to pass through Purgatory, And in Devonshire and parts of Yorkshire, they were believed to be the souls of unbaptized babies. Goodness. But, <laughs> and, and it was a great vogue in Victorian England, at least as I understand it, as I've read about it, um, collecting butterflies. And if you turn to, you know, the world of Sherlock Holmes, you just see some remarkable examples and probably 
the biggest and most memorable example of this among people who've read the cases of Sherlock Holmes has to be in The Hound of the Baskervilles. Oh, The Hound of the Baskervilles, sure. And, you know, we are recording this episode in October, and October is the consummate month in which to celebrate The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's, you know, fall is approaching, and you've you've got that, the you know, the wonderful setting of the moor, uh, and, and that's where Dr. Watson, of course, runs into Mr. Stapleton, who is out running around the moor with a butterfly net. <laughs> this is not, uh, not a common feature, I would think. Uh, although, I, I guess um, he was referred to as Stapleton the naturalist, right? Yes, but you know, I just thought of that as you, something as you said that. I wonder, is Stapleton the only villain who has the added dimension? Oh, spoiler alert, he's a villain. Has the added <laughs> added dimension of having sort of a, what one might say, a pleasant hobby now. Now, we know from one of the references to Moriarty that he had a very expensive painting. Mm. But that's not quite the same thing. I mean, here is... Here is Stapleton with this added dimension of being out in nature and not doing this for any reason of his... Well, maybe he is doing it for his own identity. Maybe his nefarious purpose was to have an excuse to wander about on the moor and well, see that's, who's there. And to, that's just it. I, I do want to explore that with you. But, you know, just in terms of thinking about other collectors, of course, Baron Gruner was an inveterate <laughs> collector. He collected China. Uh, Chinese pottery, and that's uh, how Watson uh, inveigled his way into the household. Of course, he also collected women, um, which Kitty Winter noted that he took as much pride in his collection of women as others do in their collections of butterflies or moths, um, although one might question where you put the pins uh, <laughs> in, in that case. I suppose in the photographs. So, Well, and we've talked about... Um, Grimsby Roylet and his collection of, of exotic animals, <laughs> his rotating collection of yes. exotic animals. Well, that, that was really a subscription program, right? <laughs> right. We, we talked about that. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, there, there are precious few collectors in the canon. And incidentally, for those of you who do not yet listen to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, which is our other podcast that we do where we interview notable Sherlockians and people doing interesting things in the world of Sherlock Holmes, we just had a conversation with Rebecca Romney in episode 226 there, where we talked about Sherlockian collecting. So if you're interested in the associated uh, habits of collecting, get over to IHearOfSherlock.com and check out that episode with Rebecca. But l l let's get back to this, this notion of, um, of, of Stapleton skipping across the moor. Um, now, the, the, I'm foggy on this, Bert, and maybe you can you can help me. The Sidney Paget uh, illustrations uh, for this story are iconic, and I think he's he he did one or two of Stapleton with the net. But fill me in on this: Was Stapleton wearing a boater in that picture? Oh boy, I haven't looked. A straw. Uh, it a... does. It does sound. The idea of a boater sounds familiar to me, but I can't. Um, we'll have to take a look at Nick Utekin's complete pageant portfolio to find that image. Yeah, because the be, the reason I mention that is because we we just said October, Hound of the Baskervilles month. You know, uh, the the novel is, is squarely set in October, out on the moor. Just a wonderful time of the year. Um, but as you and I both know. Um, you're not supposed to wear your straw hat after September 15th. <laughs> well, according to the Baron Gould chronology, the yes. hound took place in September of 1888. Now, I don't know to what degree that's been revised upwards, but... Um, I think it began in late September, and then right. the action out on the moor and everything happened in October, because Watson dated some of his journals, you know, October, whatever right, it was, right. 17th, 16th, etc. Right. Oh, that's so, right. But Interesting. anyway, we're we're getting off top, topic there. So Stapleton is out chasing butterflies across the moor. And an interesting point stood out to me in Don Jewell's essay where he, Stapleton, identified uh, what he was chasing as a cyclopodes. Um, 
Yeah, well, what he says to Watson is his collection of Lepidoptera. Yes. Is, he, I consider it to be, he says, the most complete in the southwest of England. And, of course, there's a scene where Watson sees this collection. You know, the walls are lined with glass top cases and so on. But I don't know to what degree he... Um, it's it's when they're out in Dartmoor and they, they first meet and Stapleton dashes off. I think he says, um, you know, this is a rare cyclopedes. So is that the point where he says this? Yeah. And, you know, one could forgive Watson as not recognizing cyclopedes as the particular... Um, uh, species of, um, uh, of, of butterfly. And, and Don Jewell says, if Watson may be excused for his error in identification, Stapleton certainly may not. His claim that Cyclopides was a very rare and seldom found, uh, was, was very rare and seldom found in late autumn was a considerable understatement. The checkered skipper uh, its uh, colloquial name, emerged from its cocoon in June or July and was not found on Dartmoor at all. It was extremely rare, as Stapleton, as Stapleton said. However, in the limited localities where it appeared in the counties of Hampshire, Huntingdonshire, Lincolnshire, Northampshire, etc., the checkered skipper could often be found in abundance. But Devon was not one of the counties listed, Devonshire. Hmm. Um, so if if Stapleton's interests in insects was merely part of his disguise, then his error could be easily explained. But, of course, we know he was an inveterate collector. Mm. So um, he says, perhaps Stapleton used the chase after the butterfly through the impenetrable Grimpenmire only to provide Watson with a few anxious moments. And the doctor probably knew little about moths and butterflies anyway. Hmm. Well, Don Jewell goes on, really, in a masterful little bit of scholarship here, and it's one of the reasons why it's fun to... This is part of the interesting bit about Sherlockian scholarship. You know, you take a look at a novel, you find a little instance like this, you pair it, in Don Jewell's case, with his deep knowledge of the natural world, and you wind up with this really interesting essay. And um, so Don Jewell says, well, what was it, if that's the case that Stapleton was really chasing after. What was this mysterious moth-like insect? And he says, you know, there were four skipper species found on the moor. Now, none of them were as colorful as Cyclopides. They include Erinus tagus, or the dingy skipper, Pergus malvi, or the grizzled skipper, Thymelicus sylvestris, or the small skipper, and Augia des venata, or the large skipper. So right there, you've got four species, different colors, none of them uh, particularly as colorful as Cyclopides. And then Don goes on to tell us about how adult females laid their eggs and exactly where this particular species was plentiful. Um, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, the, the large grizzled skipper, that was featured in Gilligan's Island, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that was in Black Peter. <laughs> there you go. Well, we'll get back to that in just a moment right after this quick word. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading Sherlockian publication since its founding in 1946 by Edgar W. Smith. In its pages, you'll find both serious scholarship and articles that play the game. The journal is essential reading for anyone interested in Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and a world where it's always 1895. If you subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, you'll get four quarterly issues as well as the Christmas Annual. You don't have to be a member of the BSI or of any Sherlockian society, for that matter, to subscribe to the journal. It's open to anyone who enjoys talking about reading about and writing about Sherlock Holmes. And you can also contribute to the BSJ. Your imagination is the only limitation there. So get on the bandwagon and subscribe to the Baker Street Journal this year. Make it an important part of your commitment 
to the world of Sherlock Holmes. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe today. All right, we are back. And while we were on the break, I was able to identify that image of the hound uh, from the Hound of the Baskervilles by Sidney Paget. Uh, there are actually two uh, with Watson and Stapleton. One uh, was Stapleton approaching Watson with the butterfly net, and the caption is, it was a stranger pursuing me. And the other is the two of them looking out over the moor and Stapleton pointing. And the caption is, that is the great Grimpen Meyer. And in both cases, Stapleton is indeed wearing a straw boater. <laughs> so, odd there in terms of the timing, but that's the way it goes. You know, you, you mentioned uh, Black Peter there. Um, he was, uh, as we, we note, um, pinned like a beetle on a card uh, by a harpoon. Uh, as uh, as the story goes, and that is very similar to how Holmes uh, viewed Stapleton as a, an adversary in the Hound of the Baskervilles when he said, um, a pin, a cork, and a card, and we <laughs> add him to the Baker Street collection. I love that. Isn't that great? It is. It is. So I wonder if um, if Stapleton, in in giving chase across the Grimpen Mire here, was, was actually out doing some of his homework. Um, either either planting or removing flags uh, across the mire, maybe inspecting it for uh, general uh, wetness and whatnot, um, as he knew the, the mire like the back of his hand, according to uh, Beryl Stapleton, his sister wife. Um, mm. <laughs> it, um, it, it, um, it, it, the, the cover of, you know, this is a Cyclopides uh, may have been a, uh, just that, a ruse to throw Watson off the scent as he, uh, as he went into the mire. Well, I think, too, you know, like an actor, Stapleton probably wanted to establish um, the caricature of, of the character that he was playing with Watson because we learn later in the case, Holmes learned at the British Museum, that Stapleton was an authority, real authority on entomology and even had his real name, which was Vandalore, attached to a species of moth, which he had been the first to describe. So, um, you know, clearly he knew uh, whereof he spoke. He should have known whereof he spoke. That is true. Um, and, and, and here we run into, you know, the wonderful uh, sense of human nature where, um, you know, even though he was trying to uh, secrete himself out in, uh, out in the wild of, uh, of, of Devonshire and, and hide until he did away with uh, Henry Baskerville, he still couldn't disassociate from his expertise in butterfly and moth collecting, and that eventually was what brought him down. Mm. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Amazing. Well, we do have another butterfly collector in the Sherlock Holmes stories, don't we? Oh, yes. Well, you know, but these these insects, you know, pop up in um, various, various places. But another collector is um, our old pal Garadab, isn't it? It is. Nathan Garadab. He was uh, an inveterate collector. Of course, his... Uh, his his uh, uh, at least what he said about himself was he could be the Han Sloan of his age, <laughs> of course Han Sloan, the founder of the British Museum, and indeed that's exactly what Holmes and Watson found when they arrived at Nathan Garadeb's place. Uh, the room was as curious as its occupant. Watson wrote. It looked mm. like a small museum. It was both broad and deep, with cupboards and cabinets all around, crowded with specimens, geological and anatomical. Cases of butterflies and moths flanked each side of the entrance. A large table in the center was littered with all sorts of debris, while the tall brass tube of a powerful microscope bristled up among them. Mm. So that's that's all that we get in terms of Garadeb's interest. It was a collection. No sense as to whether he went out and harvested them himself or whether he uh, bought them at a flea market. <laughs> or would that be a moth well, market? I, a moth market. <laughs> yeah, a flea market would be way too small. <laughs> 
You know, it's kind of like going to the farmer's market. I go every once in a while, but I've never gotten a really good farmer. <laughs> you have to look but, behind know, the stalls. It's, it's, yeah, it's well. But, you know, it's interesting. The um, This whole question, it comes up again and again in, in the canon, but also throughout Victorian literature and just looking at the age, the whole question of the difference between nature and society and the fact that the Victorians wanted to bring nature into their rooms, which accounted for so much of their furnishing. And here, Nathan Garadeb is one of these people who has these cabinets of curiosities, these little, these little samples from lifetimes of collecting. And what we know of Conan Doyle is that he did, um, you know, in a, in a smaller way, I think he also had... Um, you know, these sorts of things around him. Yeah. I mean, very Victorian uh, type thing where, um, I don't know if you, you would say it's cluttered, but, um, you know, every space t- tended to be occupied by something and collections were a great opportunity to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Well, as, as, um, as the Garadeb collection included moths as well as butterflies, I'm reminded of, uh, a famous moth joke that Norm MacDonald told. You know, Norm MacDonald just passed away in the last month or so. Great comedian. Uh, and we'll have a link to Norm actually telling this joke. I'll tell you my version of it um, as best I can. The, the reason Norm gets away with it, and it works so well with him, is because of how he prolongs the joke. But essentially, uh, there was a moth, and... Uh, he was out uh, at night wandering around, and um, he comes upon uh, a light outside this doctor's office, uh, and so he goes in. And it's, it turns out it's a podiatrist. And, the, the, you know, the moth just, just uh, sits down and goes, Doc, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm just I'm having a really tough time with my life. Everything with me seems to be aimless. I'm just I'm all over the place. I've got no, I've got no desire to live anymore, Doc. I just, I, I feel like, like the light inside me has just gone out. My, my wife doesn't love me anymore. You know, I'm laying in bed and, and I, I can't go to sleep, Doc. I am just, I'm beside myself. And I look over at this woman and I wonder, is this the woman I really married? Is this the woman I truly want to spend the rest of my life with? And I got kids, Doc. You know, my, my kids are just disappointing me one after the other. I look at my own young son. And he has that same kind of lack of spark, the, 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 the void of anything in his life that excites him. He just goes through the motions, and I look at him, and I wonder, is your life destined to be just like mine, pointless and devoid of meaning? And, Doc, I, I got to tell you, I just I, I have trouble getting up every morning. I know I've got a family to feed. I know I've got this woman who loves me, but I really question my existence in this world. And, Doc, I just, I, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope here. What can you do? And the doctor said, well, you know, you know I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a podiatrist. Why did you come to me? And the moth said, well, the light was on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's all i've got oh well it's a shame it's so short too yeah yeah <laughs> and that is anything but a trifle it is of course a trifle but there is nothing so important as trifles please join us again next week for another installment of trifles Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Across there is the great Grimpen Mire, where a false step means death. After these autumn rains, it's an awful place. I'm one of the very few people who can get to the heart of it and return alive. If it is so terrible, why should you wish to go there? Because I'm a naturalist. That's where the rare plants and butterflies are. Oh, really? 